Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us on this, the last of the 2020 digital uh, lecture series for the City Architecture Forum. If you have missed the previous lectures, uh, please go to the City Architecture Forum website and you will be able to see the complete series at your leisure. I'm Robin Brody Cooper, I'm Honorary Treasurer of the City Architecture Forum. I'm also a partner at Gleeds and I am the Senior Vice President of the British Council for Offices. Our subject tonight is 100 Liverpool Street. This is a conversion of a 1980s building into a 520,000 square foot office and sets a new benchmark for the London office market. Focusing on technology and sustainability and the well-being of its occupants, this building by British Land ticks all the boxes. It is British Land's first ultra carbon construction and its first development in the UK with a converged network and a smart enabled infrastructure. I look forward to hearing more about that. I am delighted that tonight we have two of the principals for the project. We have Charles Horn, project director of British Land and overall project director for the Broadgate Development. I've known Charles for many years and his twin brother even longer. We also have Mike Taylor, principal of Hopkins Architects and the visionary for this impressive building. Charles is going to give a perspective from the developer's point of view. And I think Mike will cover the architects and the design team's point of view. Before we hear from Charles and Mike, I would just like to say that back in January 2019, the City Architecture Forum were able to do a tour of the building mid-construction. I was fortunate enough to get a place on that tour and very enthused by the dedication of the site team led by Charles and the never-ending series of challenges they had to overcome to get this project built. I remember the first iteration of Broadgate back in the 1980s when all the buildings were clad in a red flamed granite crabbing surrounding a new ice rink. I worked in the UBS building at that time in their 100 Liverpool Street office before they moved into that nice shiny silver building on the north side of Broadgate. I think it was a, a construction by Make. This new building at 100 Liverpool Street, I feel will complement it well. May I suggest we've got, um, if you want to do the question and answers, there are features to file uh, your questions or comments. I'll trace those and put them to our guests to respond to. So Charles and Mike, if you could give us a bit of your background about your respective career paths, and then please tell us the story of the new 100 Liverpool Street project. Over to you, gents. Charlie, I think you're away first. Thank you, Robin. Thank you very much indeed. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, a little bit about my career. First of all, I've been in construction and development for over 40 years. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed my career. I feel very privileged to have met so many wonderful people like Robin and Mike uh, and, uh, and to have had the privilege to work on projects like 100 Liverpool Street. I spent a considerable amount of time at Grosvenor with His Grace the Duke of Westminster for nearly 25 years before joining British Land in 2015 to deliver the Broadgate vision, which is our strategy for turning Broadgate from a rather lazy five day a week uh, finance center into a seven day a week mixed use world-class destination. Um, I must admit that in the uh, last five years, we have had uh, a fantastic time at Broadgate, changing the campus from the uh, granite uh, clad pavilions which were in place to what you now see today and I'm excited to show you this evening the uh, um, the delivery of all the wonderful stuff we've produced at 100 Liverpool Street thanks to the thousands of people that worked on the project so Rowena if you'd be so kind the first slide please so fundamentally um, Broadgate is owned by British Land and GIC, the Government Investment Corporation of Singapore on a 50-50 uh, partnership basis. It's um, uh, nearly 5 million square feet and has the largest pedestrian campus in London, at over 32 acres. 
and our significant development pipeline will deliver a further 2.2 million square feet of offices and uh, uh, enhanced public realm space uh, over the 10 year period of our Broadgate vision strategy. Next slide, please, Rowena. The campus has been constructed in phases, um, as Robin mentioned back in the mid eighties, the buildings began with one Finsbury Avenue, the Peter Foggo building, which is now listed uh, and which we have recently refurbished um, with AHMM. And the properties have over the years been developed to create the Broadgate campus, um, which you see today. And um, on the, the timeline in front of you, you can see that we move all the way through to 2016 when we completed five Broadgate, um, a building which I personally find very attractive, uh, thanks to the good auspices of Ken Shuttleworth and Make Architects who have produced a fantastic and iconic building. Uh, next slide, please, Rowena. This graphic basically explains the journey that we're on. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, uh, Liverpool Street Station, and in the foreground, you can see Broad Street Station, which was uh, adjacent, has now been demolished. And uh, on the uh, to the east, you can see the old uh, railway sheds, which have also now been developed where we have it, our buildings on Bishopsgate. And today we have remodeled the circle and we're on a journey now to create the new Broadgate for the 21st century, uh, which you can see on the right hand side will include new pocket parks at Exchange Square and our buildings uh, to the east of uh, Liverpool Street Station. Next slide, please, Rowena. In 2016, British Land uh, produced our strategy for Broadgate, the Broadgate vision, which was to transform the five-day uh, Broadgate campus into a seven-day mixed-use central London destination. And today, if you go to Broadgate, you can see how the uh, landscape has changed with much more retail, uh, food and beverage, uh, a cinema, uh, a lot more there for enlivenment of our campus uh, outside of the norm, which was just five days a week. And we are now looking at a much more vibrant and diverse uh, campus for the 21st century. Next slide, please, Romina. It is um, a unique place, Broadgate, in that it is central to a really, really vibrant uh, locale where we have the benefit of Liverpool Street Station and in the not too distant future, the Elizabeth Line, which will provide brilliant transport infrastructure for our campus uh, and the surrounding areas, which you can see from Shoreditch to Spitterfields and across to Barbican and Old Street, where the Tech City is, is uh, makes it a much more vibrant and local uh, location uh, in the heart of the city. Next slide, please. This is our near and medium term development pipeline. Um, you can see in the center of the photograph, the, the circle and immediately adjacent on the east, the 100 Liverpool Street project, which we're talking about this evening. But further across to the east, you can see 135 Bishop's Gate, which is uh, one of our other most recent developments, uh, which was finished um, in, in, in January this year. Um, across to the west, you can see one Finsbury Avenue, the AHMM, uh, project which uh, was finished in June 2019, our first project uh, in our Broadgate pipeline. And you can also see the two projects which are next in our Broadgate pipeline, which are one to two Broadgate and finally two and three Finsbury Avenue. And I remember when I first came to Broadgate, uh, when I joined British Land, having reviewed all the buildings that would be revised, refurbished, demolished, it was quite a significant uh, redevelopment pipeline and one that uh, has changed Broadgate for the better, in my opinion. Next slide, please, Rowena. So these are our completed jobs. First of all, five Broadgate, which I think is a wonderful building, very, very sharp, almost surgical details, um, make architects completed in 2015. Uh, this now houses the uh, UBS offices. 
Um, one Finsbury Avenue, AHMM, uh, another uh, iconic building, grade two listed, uh, and now open on the ground floor to the public. Previously, as a building occupied by UBS, it was uh, a very closed environment. And then 135 Bishopsgate, where we have um, refurbished the building uh, and we have uh, tenants currently fitting out. And finally, 100 Liverpool Street, which is uh, 520,000 square feet of really swish and uh, very impressive uh, new development. Next slide, please. These are the latest emerging projects. Um, one Broadgate, where we continue our um, uh, award-winning partnership with AHMM. Um, we hope to start uh, on site in May next year. Um, and 2 to 3 Finsby Avenue, where we've been working with 3XN, um, a Danish architect from Copenhagen, which is now in for planning uh, uh, to create 700,000 square feet um, of office, retail and amenity. Next slide, please, Rowena. One of the um, first challenges that I had to face when I came to Broadgate was the tricky subject of how we were gonna procure all the development projects, given that the uh, program had many projects working concurrently, and that posed a particular risk. And that risk was the disruption of the campus, um, which would have lost the customer advocacy, which British land um, so desperately seeks to uh, uh, create. And I was concerned as well that the uh, several projects working at the same time would upset the pedestrian campus. And so we recognize that the only strategy to actually deliver this successfully with the minimum of disruption was to employ one contractor to deliver all of our projects. And in 2016, we appointed Sir Robert McAlpine as our framework contractor to deliver all of our projects at Broadgate. We have a 10 year framework agreement um, and the ambition is to have a continuous improvement, uh, the best of the best in all of our uh, working and an ethos of trust, honesty and collaboration across all that we do. There are lots of other benefits such as standardization, BIM, uh, and ultimately the biggest success of all is as at 100 Liverpool Street, we delivered the project without any adversity and the project finished and everybody who started the project were on the same terms, friendly, working collaboratively as they were right from the beginning. And that is a tremendous success. Next slide, please. This, um, this slide, these pictures tell a great deal. On the, on the left, you can see Christmas Eve 2016 when we started on site the old red clad building. Um, you can see in the background five Broadgate. When you now fast forward to the completion of the 100 Liverpool Street redevelopment, uh, you can see the much improved um, elevations of the building, much softer. Um, and behind you can just about see what is left of Ken Shuttleworth's five Broadgate, which gives you a very good understanding of the bulk massing of that particular um, a building. Uh, next slide, please, Romina. As with every project, we have a huge team and uh, there are too many to name individually, um, but there are a couple of, of individuals that I would like to just uh, say a quick thank you for. And, and they are obviously Hopkins architects who were outstanding in terms of their flair, but also their leadership of the team. Um, so Robert McAlpine have not put a foot wrong and they deserve a great deal of thanks for their endeavors. Um, and our planning consultants, DPP9, have also been a fantastic stalwart to the team uh, at every turn of every project, but in particular at 100 Liverpool Street, where um, we made several applications uh, and all of which were successfully delivered with the support of the City of London. Next slide, please, Marina. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a film that we'll show you now, which will give you much better understanding of what's involved in creating 100 Liverpool Street than words can describe. And uh, I'll give you some uh, words as we go through, but I hope you enjoy this particular video, which is the time-lapse video that we took over the last four years as we demolished and then rebuilt the building. I hope you enjoy it.
We did have some rather nice music playing, but that seems to have uh, fallen away. Here's the building being demolished. You can see we put up our lovely uh, wrap around the building to protect the visual amenity of the tenants in the circle. Uh, the building was demolished 50%, not 100%, 50%. We worked very, very hard with Hopkins and AKT to ensure we retained as much of the structure as possible in order to reduce the embedded carbon that we would be using in the building. Um, however, one of the biggest challenges was that the, de the area for demolition was above the shopping mall in uh, the uh, Liverpool Street Station, which has a considerable number of people, 150,000 people each day, walking backwards and forwards. And to demolish that and reconstruct the building uh, while 150,000 people walk under underneath on a day by day basis is a considerable challenge, um, but one which was delivered by Sir Robert McAlpine without incident or accident. And as you can see, as the structure rises from the ground, we very quickly see the cladding following on uh, behind. A really good example of the diverse nature of constructing buildings today in that the cladding came from Italy, Focchi with a contractor. Um, and together with uh, the uh, shop fronts and the uh, canopies, which were delivered by Sealy from Germany, um, there has been a myriad number of uh, contractors and products from across the world that have been delivered to 100 Liverpool Street to create the building that you see today. I wish that the construction was as easy as this film portrays. Unfortunately, it's not that easy, um, but this will have give you a pretty good uh, idea of just how successful McAlpines were in terms of their planning and their uh, uh, execution of the project. Thank you, Romina. Can we move on to the next slide? So a little bit about the key challenges. Obviously, the, the, the scale and the complexity of the project were a challenge in themselves. However, um, the significant challenge that we faced fundamentally was that the building had three public transport interchanges that we had to deal with. The network rail shopping mall through the center of the building was in itself a huge challenge, our, our largest challenge. But we also had a bus station within the building, which we had to move and, uh, um, um, and uh, remodel and, re and return. And we also had Crossrail at the front of our building. And working with those three sets of um, public sector um, transport companies was very, very difficult. Um, however, through a great deal of collaboration, we have had nothing but success and uh, each are to be congratulated for their attitude uh, and their endeavors in working with us collaboratively. The, um, the live shopping mall I've mentioned already, but I haven't mentioned yet the lowering of the fulcrum. And the fulcrum, as many of you will know, is the uh, Richard Serra sculpture, which is at the west end of that uh, shopping mall, the Octagon Mall, um, and was uh, the subject of a rather complex uh, civil engineering exercise in lowering it by 1.4 meters in order to create a flat and constant shopping mall through to our next project, One Broadgate. And I'll talk to you more about that in a moment or two. Uh, and lastly, um, and last couple of challenges, smart technology is um, a new, uh, relatively new innovation. Uh, it is uh, without doubt an ever-changing uh, 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 element of our project. I feel very proud to have delivered a, a very contemporary scheme that is now available for our tenants to use, um, but it has been uh, a difficult and uh, challenging uh, exercise in putting in what is not always uh, everyone's expertise. Insolvency has been a problem. There were two or three insolvencies, the worst of which was the uh, cladding contractor who was doing the internal atrium. Uh, their, um, their insolvency created a huge problem for Sir Robert McAlpine, but thankfully they were able to recover and find another contractor who finished 
just four days before practical completion. And lastly, of course, COVID-19 has in itself been somewhat of a challenge. I'm pleased to report that again, uh, because of the hard work of the team that we have, we haven't had any outbreaks of COVID-19 during our construction. Uh, and we did manage to complete our project um, without too much delay uh, in the summer. Next slide, please, Rowena. Now, I mentioned to you the fulcrum and this video will, I hope, explain to you what lowering a fulcrum means. If you play the video, Rowena, I can explain to the audience as we go. So the fulcrum uh, was on the top of a ramp and the ramp meant that our shop fronts diminished as you rose up the ramp which is not ideal for a shopping mall, and therefore we decided to lower the fulcrum. And so thanks to the helpful um, uh, interjection of DP9, um, we uh, persuaded the City of London and the artist, Richard Serra, that lowering this would be the best thing to do in order to create a flat and continuous uh, shopping mall all the way through. And as you may see from these, uh, this, these, the film, the, um, the process was to isolate the structure on which the 200 tonnes of core 10 steel sat. And then once it was isolated, as you can see there, like a tear on a cake, we, um, we put our gauge on the right hand side there and we began to lower it 1.4 metres using hydraulic jacks. And uh, in total, including the slab, that was 500 tonnes dead weight. And to lower that over the course of a couple of days is not something I would suggest many of you get involved with because it is rather stressful. Um, but I should have known better than to have doubted our colleagues at AKT and Sir Robert McAlpine because it was lowered successfully over the course of two days. And we now have a flat unified mall that runs all the way from the concourse of the station, right the way through to our next development, one broad gate, so that we will have a unified shopping mall from one end to the other. And as a result, we have nice large shop fronts that our retailers uh, are currently fitting out, ready for the end of lockdown on the 3rd of December. Um, if any of you are looking for Christmas presents, uh, I would encourage you to go to the Octagon Mall where it is now looking rather nice and Christmassy, and there are lots of wonderful gifts. So lowering the fulcrum uh, was another one of our key successes. It was also one of our major challenges. Uh, and I hope I never have to repeat that particular exercise again. Um, but great fun, all the, less, all, the, all, the, all, all the same. As you can see, once the fulcrum was lowered, we could create all the ground floor walkways and all they, they've all now been connected up so that we now have complete access, pedestrian access all the way around the building and east-west through the shopping mall as well. Rowena, can you put the next slide on, please? So a few key stats about the building. Um, it's, it's a big building, that's half the challenge, nearly three quarters of a million square feet, um, of which we have 440,000 square feet uh, net internal area of offices and 80,000 square feet of uh, retail um, over 10 storeys uh, above ground. We've got 32 lifts and nine escalators. And uh, we have had, as I mentioned earlier, a worldwide supply chain. The escalators came from China. Uh, a lot of the lights came from the United States. Uh, as I mentioned, the cladding uh, came from Italy and Germany. So it has been a, a worldwide uh, endeavor to bring all the equipment and all the uh, supplies to Broadgate uh, using our consolidation center in order to reduce uh, uh, congestion and, and pollution uh, in the area. Next slide, please. Sustainability is a major uh, part of our redevelopment. Um, British land are very focused where sustainability is concerned. We are about to be awarded uh, a BRIAM outstanding rating for our building. Uh, that's a fantastic achievement. We, we set out to um, receive the rating below that, but Ultimately, we've managed to beat our own uh, standards and are delivering an outstanding building, which I think is um, in, in the 1% of buildings that have achieved that in this country. We have a well gold uh, certification. And perhaps the biggest uh, success is the fact that we currently have an embedded carbon of, of 400 kilograms, which 
is a fantastic achievement, uh, bearing in mind this building um, was 50% demolished. Uh, that has enabled us to beat our own target, our, our current 2030 target of 500 kilograms, um, which is a great, great result for the whole team. And obviously, in line with, with many buildings of this nature, we have all sorts of uh, benefits for sustainability, from photovoltaics to, to rainwater attenuation. But these next two stats, you know, 32% of the steel frame, the existing steel frame is still there and 49% of all the concrete has been retained. And that is where the benefit of um, keeping your structure and saving on embedded carbon, it really pays off. And we have actually now um, offset unavoidable carbon uh, so that our building can be described as a net zero carbon building. And working with Robert McAlpine, we have delivered a whole host of uh, great sustainable benefits um, from landfill being reduced to less than 1%, and uh, all the timber being from uh, FSC, well-managed forests. So a really good example of British land's commitment to sustainability and a fantastic achievement by our, our whole team. Next slide, please, Marina. Smart technology. This has been, uh, for me anyway, uh, quite a challenge. Uh, I've learned a great deal. Um, I feel now that we have a building that really can be fully uh, smart if, and when our tenants uh, in, in, uh, input all their own smart technology, which will work with us. We have developed a Broadgate app, which will allow our tenants to uh, use their um, phones to arrange for a number of services, as well as to control uh, access and also uh, other elements of the building. Um, you can see that we're looking at promoting health and well-being as a, as a massive part of the offer that British Land have at Broadgate. And it gives our FM team a great opportunity for managing the building as efficiently as possible and to create an enabler uh, as the workplace. And one of the most useful um, facts that was used to describe to me technology, uh, smart technology, was that it's an iterative process. It is the digital journey that we're all on. And the uh, way I try to describe that is to say to people that before we had Uber cabs, we, we needed a, a, a very realistic and accurate uh, system to uh, direct those vehicles. And hence, Google Maps came before Uber cabs. And that's the basis of my understanding of smart technology. It's a constant journey that we're all on. And where we are today with COVID-19, it's accelerated uh, where we are. Our new buildings are even smarter. We're using uh, smart technology to create a lot more understanding of how the spaces are used. Um, and what the air quality is like in order to protect our tenants and to make the space a much more uh, beneficial uh, space for them to work in. Uh, next slide, please, Rowena. Th this is my last slide. And basically, I just want to put you all in the picture with regards to where we are. We, we have let all the floors between levels nine and 10, uh, sorry, second, second to nine, only the 10th floor is not let. We've let 17 out of 19 units. Um, and we have six restaurants out to market, uh, which gives you a really good uh, example of how successful the redevelopment of 100 Liverpool Street is. Um, I'm going to finish by showing you this uh, leasing film for our 10th floor space. Uh, I make no apologies. I hope you enjoy it, uh, as I hope you've enjoyed my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. And uh, after we finish this particular video, I'll hand over to Mike. Rowena, thank you very much. I think we've lost the sound, unfortunately, but this gives you a good example of the um, tent floor and the building in terms of its access. Obviously, because we are over a shopping mall, we have two entrances that take us up to this area here, the second floor, which is where we have our cafe, which is open to the public. And there's our atrium, which was uh, the cause of much um, concern because of the insolvency of the contractor. You can see the drum there at the top of the atrium. And you can see the roof terrace that goes with level 10, um, which gives you a fantastic vista from the east and the west. Um, and the floor now is uh, currently vacant, ready for uh, tenants 
And we are very proud to see that when you stand on that roof terrace there, it really is the most unique of spaces. It gives you a great view of what working in central London is all about. It's been a great privilege working on this particular project with all the wonderful people, thousands of people. And I'm very proud to be a small part of the British land success, which has been 100 Liverpool Street. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Charles. Can you see me, everybody? Um, my name is Mike Taylor. I'm a principal at Hopkins Architects. And just to introduce myself, I would say I'm passionate about design and sustainability. And I have been very fortunate in my career here to have worked on some really amazing projects that combine both of those things. So London Velodrome 2012, uh, WWF Living Planet Centre and the School of Forestry at Yale being particular examples. And this project here, 100 Liverpool Street. I also feel very privileged to be working in London um, and I'm currently working on projects at the All England Club in Wimbledon. I'm also uh, fortunate to be working with Duent and the Portman Estate on a mixed use development on Baker Street. And we are working on the London Peninsula at Hyde Park Corner. I will now endeavour to share my screen and take you through what is basically a one hour lecture and a one and a half hour trip around the building condensed down with some serious compression to uh, hopefully just 20 minutes. So I'm going to be going at enormous speed. It's pretty much going to be like watching a movie frame by frame, slowed down rather than a slideshow. I hope that's okay. But I am mindful that everybody is at home and we would normally be in the building and that would be a whole, a whole lot better than watching me talk on Zoom once again. Let's give this a go. Can you see that, Charles? Can you give me the thumbs up if you can see it? Thank you, Charles. OK, so the thing about Broadgate, this is the 80s. It was this singular unity uh, around that central circle. And we came to the project um, looking at 100 and the, the building behind it. So when, when we started work, two significant changes that Charlie's mentioned. Number five was going up and Crosswell arrived at the start. The challenge for us really was the Peter Fogo scheme was idiosyncratic really by modern office use. And we had a number of challenges externally and internally. And those challenges extended actually to the public realm where, where changes of level were really, you know, very, very difficult from a DDA point of view. So uh, internally, it was not very lettable. We had very, very narrow spaces between core and the perimeter. We had atria more or less on the outside of the building and it was very hard to subdivide. So that was a real challenge. But as, as Charles has said, you know, we had some really significant issues in reformatting that building. We had a station, we had a bus station, we had network rail retail underneath it. We had a basement underneath that. We had public circulation. We had the sculpture at St. Paul's Heights and we had to keep 50% of the structure. So <clears throat> we took inspiration from a number of factors and we were very lucky. The foundations had a lot of spare capacity. The building was designed at a time when they weren't sure what was happening above. Uh, and they'd started construction before necessarily knowing how much weight was going on them. So there was capacity there. We also had a very, very heavy facade. We knew if we took that off, we'd gain some capacity. And we had a client who was visionary in what they wanted for the estate and gave us great backing to take that forward. So the diagram we came up with when we were sort of first pitching for the job was to look at that frame and say, well, you've got to sort your cores and your atria out. And we started to move things around and started to get to bring some sort of rationale to the internal process in line with modern office space. And that led us to moving the cores, moving the atrium into the middle and starting to look at how we could sort of fill the spaces around the edge of the building, keeping the structure. And we came up with this image really, which was an aesthetic vision for how we might reconcile the new volume of the building, it is very big, with, the, with all the passageways and entrances. So we had this sort of worn away uh, almost like a, a pebble that's been worn away by water. And we thought the rounded corners would really soften this. And that, that image from the interview literally was something that we maintained throughout. As I say, the construction um, did allow an extra capacity and AKT were able to delve into the amazing archive of British land. And they had 
not only the calculations of the original structure, but they had all the on-site test data. And that meant we knew exactly how everything would perform and we could load it up. So fortunate that's how they did things back in uh, the mid eighties. And we were able to put three floors of accommodation on top of the building, move the plant room up and add three floors. And that's on the same foundations. You see there the network rail underneath and the gyratory. Um, the, at the front of the building where we were really remodeling the cores quite drastically, we removed that part of the structure, but we kept the structure at the back, you know, right the way back to number five. And it was a really challenging exercise for the team to do that. And it necessitated extraordinary amounts of contractor design temporary works like that image in the middle there, just to keep the thing intact. It was like a bad day at the dentist. Um, and this shows AKT's journey on that uh, from the original 50% retained and then the new frame built on top of that. We had one or two new piles go in but, and one or two very small areas of transfer structure, but largely we managed to work on the existing foundations. I guess the other challenge for us was, you know, what is the identity of this building? Make had put um, UBS's number five at the back and had sort of taken inspiration from an ingot, a solid building, and they'd worked away with some um, perforate openings at the top. The bottom of the building there with UBS's brief was quite solid. They didn't want retail in that building. And we had an altogether different challenge and opportunity in that the station concourse had always connected underneath our building and the desire was to, to maintain that and to work with it. Uh, and as the project progressed, we actually increased the amount of retail in it and got more ambitious. So the original space underneath the, the original building looked like something like this and actually had a single height, single story height underneath that passageway, some rather interesting uh, 80s metal and glass trimmings there. And that inevitably had been filled in with kiosks uh, over the years and the network rail retail, the kind of anchors of British retail, Marks and Spencers, WH Smiths and Boots uh, were around that space and still are. And so our vision really was to, to kind of clear out that space and tidy everything up and see if we could make that, that mall much more grand and more coherent as well as organizing the building all around it. So this was the early vision was to make a double height space through the mall put the reception of the office above that and then have two routes in, one from the circle, one from Liverpool Street up to that reception. You'll see though, as Charlie mentioned, that Octagon Mall is about um, just over a metre higher than the Mall and that was not great. So uh, we wanted to lower it like this and have a double height passageway through. And this was our sort of pitch at the start of the job. And that what that meant was that the there's our building, there's the station on the right. To get to one and two, the AHMM project, you had to go up to the fulcrum. And if they were going to do something like we were, which they have, you would be sort of going up to come down. And so that was the benefit of lowering the fulcrum. We got continuity of space and continuity of public realm at that level and a much clearer, coherent second level. So this is the section we ended up with, looking towards the fulcrum from the station, a triple height space, as it turned out, but with balconies in at the ground floor level. And then the lower ground is the mall level. So quite complicated. And if you cut a section in the other direction, you've got the fulcrum on the left, the one to two brocade on the left as it was, and there's our uh, office reception at the bottom of the drum. And there you see the station on the right. And so we have a four story opening onto the fulcrum and then two single story openings off to the station, which I will show you in a minute. So sort of working in BIM, which is an absolutely integral part to this project, which was extraordinarily complex in terms of its three dimensionality, and retained a new structure. This is our lower ground floor level where you see the retail spaces, you see the fulcrum sat at its new lowered level and you see the touchdown point for the escalators which then take you up to the ground floor level. And so this is how you enter from Liverpool Street, is how you enter from the circle. It's also a way into a restaurant off Liverpool Street. You see some lifts there to the left of the reception which will take you straight up to level nine to a restaurant. You see Crossrail and you see the sort of the connecting balconies of the second floor of the retail space. The office reception, as I said, sort of is effectively two floors above that on level two. And those escalators from those two entrances take you up to this space. The red is the reception, the green is sort of breakout and coffee cafe space. And then you have the cores coming down and all you need to make that office work. Obviously very, very complicated sandwich of uses one on top of the other. So some images now um, from a few weeks ago and a few from last week. This is the 
the Mall, which is, I have to say, a fantastic space to, to walk through, very imposing, very generous, and you get a great view of the Richard Serra at the end of this new flat floor, all completely repaved. Um, coming in past the Serra from Liverpool Street, you know, we've designed it to sort of hopefully draw you in and make it very inviting. You get a glimpse up to the reception and you get ways down. So it works on many levels. Here you are on the upper of those two levels with the um, escalators to take you down to station level in the distance. And you can look up to the reception. And then looking on this, actually, there you are. There's your reception at the top. Everything sort of wrapping around in quite a curvilinear fashion. And as you make your way into that space, uh, you get views on the different levels. So I think it'd be very sociable, very interactive. When we all finally go back out there, this will be very lively and an extension of the circle and a very good connection between the station and the circle. So when you go along, these are the escalators that take you down to the station and you get your view out to the old street there. And coming in from that street, coming back in the other way, this is one of the uh, canopies we put over the entrances. And then looking down, looking south, here's the view down Old Broad Street. And so I think it was an architectural challenge uh, for Chris Bannister and everyone who worked on the team to, to sort of get this together. It's a relatively simple concept. Uh, and they worked amazingly well on the integration of all those elements. And I, what we really did was make the building from a series of slithers. We chopped it into a, a very large number of very small pieces. And we'd learned on the velodrome that if you work with faceting, you can do a lot and actually it's much more cost effective to work with flat panels and the little metal ribs we used on the velodrome were kind of a big influence on how we resolve the curvilinear nature of this building and so every single part of the building was broken up into flat pieces of very uh, interconnecting geometry and you'll just look on the very far left of the screen we had an odd bit of curved glass so we have very tight radii absolutely everywhere else it was flat glass and we managed to make that work by putting these metal fins in that provided this sort of visual break between pieces of glass. They also were absolutely instrumental in how we shaded the building. Um, so we had sort of panels at the bottom and the, these fins which gave us shading. And we were trying to get about 60% glazing. And what we were going to end up with fan call units. And we worked out that 60% glazing was going to work for us pretty well. 40% uh, didn't offer a massive benefit over that. So we were getting the benefit of good daylighting into the space. Um, and everything that went with that. So we worked very hard on that and we ended up with a, a, a G value of about 30.5 and a sort of light transmission of about 60%. But we were quite keen not to go down that route that we showed at the start on the left, which was to have solid panels. We like this idea of the glazing and the translucency. And so we hit upon this thing where we would sort of trap light in the double glazed unit by fritting on the back of the outer face and fritting on the inner face when we had solid spandrel panels. And we played around with color and we played around with an enormous number of sort of options for, for the material and the, the color we used in the end. And um, uh, opted for what we had on the right. We liked the way that shimmered and picked up light and had a depth to it. Uh, Focky were fantastic, I have to say. This is out at their works on the Adriatic coast. This is the some of the mock-ups where we were sort of trying. You can see their different versions of events. And there's a sort of skirt at the bottom of the building that we were trialing there. It was all unitized. It could be brought into the building without tower cranes lifting the individual panels up. So it all went on actually incredibly well. And I think the, the thing about that geometry and about those fins is it reads sometimes as completely transparent and just takes that curvature of effortlessly into its into its form at other times it reads as totally solid uh, and that transition on this on this curvature is it does work well and gives it a sort of um, a level of visual interest that you get from moving around it and you get from the sun and the clouds passing over it and it you get this effect which you see here of transparency through the glass but you also get shading and you get reflectance off the glass onto the fins and so it does give you a large number of sort of variables which makes it interesting. Uh, you'll see there at the bottom the canopy which is an extension of that faceted system. This is the main entrance on 100 Liverpool Street so you would come into this entrance, uh, go into the lobby and we work with UDS on the sort of pitching of the interiors for the receptions. They came up with these nice images of the old Broad Street station and the, the train lines. We weren't masters of our own destiny in terms of where all the columns were. And we, we knew we'd have these sort of interesting dynamic shifts of circulation around the building. And these sort of tram lines, rail lines were kind of useful for steering us up and around the building. 
you come in through the reception, here's the escalator, you arrive at the top. And then this graphic device was a sort of handy way of taking us around the building. Here's, there's the escalator arriving at the top. Here you are in the atrium, tenants yet to go in, but otherwise ready to go. And then you look up and see this amazing space that's top lit. Every single floor has got a different cutout into that space. So it's, it's geometric. The geometric void is fascinating. You've got a stair that takes you up. And then you stand in the middle and look up and get this Oculus view. And it is interesting. That was what our graphics department were predicting it was going to look like, which was great. And we weren't far off. Some things weren't predicted, such as these guys going bust, Wagner Bureau. Um, so McAlpine's did a great job buying out the bits of metal and bringing them to London. But it did mean some remedial measures, such as the Project Nappy, which is seen here. We had to put this over that space to stop it flooding so that work could carry on. Water would filter down that blue tube and be tanked out. So very uh, pragmatic way of carrying on with the project. Other things were anticipated, like the sort of James Bond BM unit, unit, which tracked across that diagrid worked very well. Here you see it emerging on the left out of his little hideaway, and then it comes out and does all manner of sophisticated things to clean all the glass in that atrium. And then we did develop the design during the project. So, you know, it was difficult to light that space. There was so much glass, we we're going to get glare if we didn't manage it carefully. And we didn't want very bright floodlights coming down from the top. So Spears and Major did a great piece working with us on this chandelier, which was going to illuminate the lower levels, get nice light in there and not block the view up. There it is in the space over the reception and then with the daylight coming down from the top as well. Um, and we had, there you see how it sort of hangs down as part of the architecture. We had this staircase, which was pre-COVID, I have to say, but was a, a great sort of instruction to come into the project that that was going to be completely open and take you right up to the top. So all tenants can use that stair and it connects, it's com it connects straight off the lift core into that space without any screening. So great in terms of people being able to come in and just walk up to their floor plate unhindered by barriers and being in confined spaces. Um, if you come in from the other entrance then, so you're in the circle, this is the Barry Flanagan sculpture that's already there. Here's the other entrance at the same ground floor level. You come in, uh, you've got another set of escalators in front of you. On the left is a Lubna Chowdhury uh, piece of art, which brightens that space again, based on kind of railway motifs. So you come up the escalator with the oak paneling and you start to arrive in this dramatic space. You see the halo, you see the lighting effects. And then standing at the reception, you get this great view back out and just see the top of the Richard Serra sculpture. And you see the light coming down and the two routes down to the ground plane. So very dramatic. Um, so just to whiz you through the plan, there was some ingenious um, efforts from the wider design team to get everything on this project. So we're in the basement now. The green is the bike storage. To fit that into the project, we had to excavate down. The grey are the pile caps. The orange is the cut-off slabs. So you're sort of in the ground there to fit those bikes in. Moving up, the brown are the retailers. Um, you've got your, your mal space going through there. Uh, the next floor is the, the, the entrances. The restaurant I mentioned is, is here. The restaurant entrance with the lifts that take you up to level nine. The bus station is here and the bus station sort of sits underneath the back of the building and this space here isn't a plant room or just screening. That's where we had to squeeze in all the bike showers. So the cyclists got their changing space and we gave them, you know, nice, nice space in there. Absolutely squeezed between the trusses holding up the building above the bus station. Uh, and then as we go up the building, there's your reception space. Uh, and as you go up, you start to see this atrium, which changes shape as you go up. And as you, you're on those floor plates, you're looking across and got great views. And you can see right through to number five. You can see out of the building, you see the staircase. So I think even the middle of this building will be very animated. Going up, we've got nice bathrooms in the cores. Going up. Uh, and then as you go higher and look down, there's your reception desk, great views and the tram lines. And as you go high, you start to hit the terraces. And this was a great opportunity we worked on with HED to put landscape on those terraces. Uh, so level seven, level eight, and on the front of the building on level eight, on the south facing area, we have olive trees. And on level nine is the restaurant above that. And on the back of the building on level nine, there's a series of terraces here. And the restaurant has access to this one, which is here, views out to St. Paul's. And then on level 10, we get some bigger terraces like this, which are all very nicely planted. And then above that, we've got the plant rooms. And we were not keen to just put the, the regulation sort of plant room facade up there. 
So the team worked out a means of using the similar glazing, pushing that back. Like other buildings in the city, we had to have louvers over the top. So it's part of the same look. And so we vented in at the bottom and vented out at the top. All looks fantastic. And then in terms of tenants, um, the floor plate of about 62,000 square feet can be divided up into one, two, three or four tenants. So that all works extremely well. Uh, we managed to keep some good floor to ceiling heights. We had retained structure. We had some new floors. So we're between 2.8 and 3.4 for floor to ceiling, clear space, clear height. Uh, and those, as Charles said, have been letting extremely well. You've got fantastic views out from some of those floors and lots of them have access to terraces and they all have a view into the atrium, which is great. And then just to recap on the sustainability front, the building you know, ticks a number of boxes. And I think mainly the, the reuse of the frame and the foundations was the sort of real strong point. I guess, in conclusion, you have to really work very hard to do it. And you do have to pay for some things you wouldn't have done on a greenfield site. But I think the end result is testament to what you can achieve with that. And then I think, um, interestingly, the Google headquarters says it's a sort of skyscraper on its side. I think this project is as well. I think the I think the cheese grater isn't that about 650,000, we're 520. We're not far off NIA matching that. We, we got the NIA of this project up by 45% from what was on site before, which is a pretty good achievement. But I think the sociability of this and the compactness and the access to the terraces, which you wouldn't get in the tower, was going to be absolutely um, you know, fantastic for the tenants and for the estate as a whole. And I think... Um, I was only involved at the start of this project, really, and then just kept a watching eye on it. My colleague Jim uh, pitched in with all the big ideas at the start, and Chris Bannister has fantastically led the team on behalf of Hopkins. That list there shows you how many people you need to sort out a project like this. So many thanks from me to everyone on our team who worked on it. And I think we also need to mention the whole design team who have been absolutely superb on the project, as Charles said, uh, including, you know, McAlpines who came in uh, early on to help us get everything sorted. I won't list everyone out, but I do think it is true that we had a very good working relationship and we're all very, very proud of the building and we're desperately sad we can't show you around it. And that's me finished. Thank you. Brilliant. What a fantastic uh, uh, summation on that building. Charles, Mike, you have enlightened us all on a fabulous project and uh, a lot of hard work gone into that. Well done. Uh, while people are thinking of questions and comments to ask, I'd uh, like to ask the first question. Um, your site was very much interlinked with Liverpool Street Station and the bus station. What challenges did you have when dealing with the general public? and keeping them informed of what you were doing, because there were so many aspects going on and trying to keep people safe and informed. How did you get over it, Charles? Well, the, the first thing we did was we built a very, very close working relationship with Network Rail and also with the uh, Transport London buses and, and the Crossrail teams. And the, the key for any big development that's uh, as large as this is all about communication. And when we first went out to the market, we asked our contractors to propose to us how they were going to improve uh, communication. And McAlpines came back with an app, uh, which was quite unique, uh, probably not so much now. But the Broadgate construction app was a fantastic tool, which we used to inform the public uh, and our tenants, all stakeholders, of precisely what was happening each day. Uh, areas that were going to be closed or reopened, uh, what works were going on and when. Uh, and it was very, very successful. We had thousands of people that uh, subscribed um, and we were able to pe keep people informed uh, and make sure that there were not surprises, which is the major cause of complaint. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that uh, having completed the project now and looking back, we never had any major concerns. We certainly never had any incidents or accidents and I'm very proud that uh, we completed that project almost without anybody moaning. I'm sure there were one or two complaints, but there were no significant complaints because of the um, communication that we worked so hard to push out. Brilliant. Right, I've got a question from Steve W. He said, very comprehensive and fascinating presentations. Thank you both. 
from any perspective, from design to procurement to construction, is there anything you would have done differently with the benefit of hindsight? Um, uh, can I say there, I think the one thing we regret was not making a connection through to the Crossrail station. It was we, lit, we did look at it in great detail with the British land. But it, it was extremely difficult due to changes of level and network rail, retail ownership and everything else. And we just in the end said we couldn't really do that. But I think um, if everything was more straightforward uh, in life in this country, we might be we might have done that. But that's probably the only thing I can think of. Charles. Well, there's a few things that I can think of. Um, <laughs> Not surprisingly, unsurprisingly. Um, the, the, the first thing is we, we, we began on site, we hadn't fully concluded the stage four design. And if there's a lesson to be learned, it is that you should always uh, complete stage four and end up with a fully coordinated, complete design. Otherwise you end up with provisional sums and provisional sums are uh, difficult to manage at the best of time. So that would be the first lesson. The second lesson was a practicality lesson, which was we took the choice through value engineering of building our lift shafts out of plasterboard. Don't do it. The, the, the savings initially are eclipsed by the costs that, uh, that flow from the lift contractors needing to span between floors. Uh, so it proved to be a bit of a false economy. Um, and the last thing, the last thing I would say is this, um, one of the, key lessons that we learned was that when you're using foreign suppliers you have to be very switched on in terms of visiting overseas their factories testing their products and making sure that what is delivered to you is absolutely spot on um, in particular uh, with the lift industry uh, that is a very important aspect of the success of any project um, to make sure that what you've ordered is what's going to be delivered, that there aren't any issues around different markets or cultures, um, and it's paying dividends in the, sh in, in the long term to spend more money up front to make sure you really manage that very, very closely to iron out any problems that come back to hurt you uh, later. So serious critical review of all foreign suppliers. Thank you. Um, right, another question from Ken Shuttleworth. What would you have done differently if you have heard of COVID-19? Well, I would have bought shares in anyone that was <laughs> selling products to do with COVID-19, in particular face masks. Um, I think that the whole, the, the management of the COVID uh, pandemic um, by the construction industry has been really, really well done. Uh, it's difficult at the best of times to, to work on a construction site and to maintain social distancing. But I must say that all the contractors that I've seen, and there's been several, not just our own uh, Sir Robert McAlpine, but also the fit out contractors that are working at 100 Liverpool Street, have all worked really, really hard to make sure that they've looked after the safety, safety of their staff on site. Um, the HSE have been very, very proactive in making sure that people treat this as a priority. And I'm very proud to see that we haven't seen any major issues uh, with COVID affecting the workforce uh, at 100 Liverpool Street. I think in terms of the design, I mean, everyone's having that discussion, you know, should we change the office workplace? Should we change things around? I mean, I think it's, it's a difficult one, isn't it? If we all get inoculated and in a year or two's time is gone away, then, then you know, what's going to be the next, nature of the next pandemic if and when it comes? So... I don't think in design terms, there's really anything we would have changed. We'd probably have bought a load more laptops before we knew about it because we've all been working from home. But I think everyone has done amazingly well to adapt, you know, both in our office and collectively across the industry. And obviously working on sites a challenge because you're, you know, you're physically in the same space. But um, and I think we've all coped with it pretty well, psychologically as well as physically. Great. Thank you. Uh, one more final question uh, before I, I start to, to wrap up. Um, from Xavier Aguilo, he says, the CO2 emissions are only for stages A. Could you provide us with a whole carbon footprint? Have you reused, reused the demolished structures to work as temporary ones? 
I, I presume you're referring to the circular economy and, and using existing structural components. No, we didn't use ex existing structural components. We did use parts of the existing structure um, uh, uh, elsewhere. We, we obviously crushed the concrete and reused that. Um, uh, but the uh, whole carbon, I can provide that. I won't be able to provide that this evening, but I can give you a full breakdown of that if you want to. Brilliant. Well, I get a gentleman that was a fantastic uh, presentation and what an amazing building to have been uh, working on. And uh, I, what I can say is uh, on behalf of the ladies and gentlemen watching you, I'd just like to extend a big thank you to Charles and Mike for telling us the wonderful story of this building. It's just part of the redevelopment of Broadgate and I'm sure we will be following with great keenness to see the shape and style of the future buildings being created in this unique location. So thank you and uh, we look forward to getting some tours when we can get more physical on site and uh, this COVID-19, wretched COVID-19 is well behind us. I'm just going to inform uh, uh, all those who are watching, um, just quickly, quickly inform you uh, of the current bill, uh, current calendar of events uh, for 2021, uh, which we're putting together. Some will be virtual and hopefully some will be physical later on in the year. Uh, the events uh, for the following buildings, uh, which we're hoping to look at in 2021, are going to be, uh, we're going to focus on 135 Bishop's Gate, uh, 77 Coleman Street, 80 Fenchurch Street, and of course we're celebrating uh, next year the Forum's 30th anniversary, which is uh, quite some, uh, 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 I suppose, mark to, uh, to get to. Um, we've watched our city evolve and it is looking pretty, pretty good at the moment. Uh, for those of you who are non-members of the Forum, um, may I suggest you uh, um, get onto our website and have a look about joining. Um, it's by doing these seminars that we get to see these exciting projects uh, being delivered in this wonderful city of London. Um, I'd just like to say a big thank you again to Mike and Charles. Uh, you have been absolutely fabulous tonight. Um, and I'd like to thank Rowena, who's been, been in the background sorting out all the uh, presentation materials. And uh, I want everyone to stay well and safe. Uh, thank you and good night from us all. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank Robin. you. Thanks, Rowena. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, Robin.